Um, I did a, a form of this presentation at the last three uh, fab techs. There's a, uh, a workshop that uh, has been held. It's called, So You're the New Welding Engineer. Um, and I talked there about um, some of the important aspects of uh, different types of welding standards. Um, they, uh, they asked me to, to put that presentation in the form of a, uh, an article. So in the uh, June 2015 um, edition of the Welding Journal, there's an um, article called Getting Started as a Welding Engineer. So it has some of the elements uh, of my talk. And, and also a, of interest here is that uh, I, I kind of took some shots at D11 uh, in my presentation and, uh, and in this article. And one of the members of D11 took exception to that and wrote a letter to the editor. So in the, in the November edition, you have the, uh, uh, his uh, comments and then my rebuttal uh, to that. So uh, you always got to stir the pot, you know? Um, as as uh, Rich said, uh, I'm a graduate welding engineer with over 40 years of experience. Um, and during that time, I've been a very active participant in a number of uh, AWS technical committees. And one thing I will say to everyone here is these committees are open to everyone. So if you, if you know of a, I mean, they have these committee meetings uh, around the country at different locations. Uh, if one comes to your town, show up, just sit in, listen, listen to what they have to say. Uh, I will tell you that it's, it's a very educational experience. Um, and um, I have derived a, a, a great deal of knowledge just from my participation on these technical committees. Um, I've also created a number of training programs related to welding technology, welding inspection, and welding standards. Um, some of you might have seen the uh, the training manual that AWS uses for the CWI program, that welding inspection technology. Um, I, I wrote the original version of that back in, uh, back in the dark ages, back in 1985 uh, approximately, uh, and it's still being used. So, but one of the benefits here is during this career, I've had the opportunity to kind of straddle the line between technology and, and welding quality. Uh, which, and, and also in, in various industries. And it kind of helps me get a, a better perspective on uh, what requirements are. And it is these welding standards that provide us the framework so that we can actually maneuver through um, all these technical and quality requirements for various fabrication and manufacturing activities. So I'm going to touch a little bit on, uh, on some of those, but what I, I'd really like to emphasize is you as educators need to, need to help your students understand what these standards are and how those standards are going to impact their uh, careers. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the standards themselves, but also talk about possible ways for you to incorporate uh, some of the information from these standards into your programs. So as we prepare our students, uh, whether they know it or not, uh, they are either going to be directly or indirectly affected by these standards as they enter the job market. Uh, so it, it's up to us to help prepare them as much as we can. Um, and another thing that I, I think is so critical is that the more you and the more your students know about these standards, <coughs> the better prepared they're going to be for their current job, and it can also provide a pathway to other uh, advancements. Um, and I've seen many cases where um, an individual starts out as a welder, he moves uh, possibly a lot of times we see them move into a welding technician role, uh, welding technologist, uh, 
and I've seen cases where they move all the way to a, a welding engineer uh, status, with the welder being the, uh, the basis of that uh, progression. I've seen a lot of welders that progress from welders to welding inspectors. Another, uh, and, and in, in my career, I find that in, as far as I'm concerned, the best welding inspectors are those that have been welders before, or at least have a working knowledge of welding. So really our goal is to help develop, help them develop an appreciation and understanding of these standards and not a fear. That's what we want to avoid. And I think we all become intimidated by these welding standards, but the more we know about them, the more comfortable we become and the better we are prepared for our work. So how do we accomplish this? Well, number one, it has to be done in a manner that's as painless as possible, both for you as well as the student. Um, I don't propose teaching codes and standards. I mean, uh, it's a good way to put people to sleep is to stand up and, and try to teach a standard. Uh, I'm not as dynamic as Mr. Patrick here. He can, uh, he can bring, bring the subject to life. Uh, but if we bring small bits and pieces of these standards into our programs and feed them to the students, sometimes they don't even realize they're, they're getting the information. But um, so we want to be able to introduce stuff without that being the focal point. Um, and I'm, I'm going to throw out a challenge to AWS, and I think in, in many cases they have already accomplished this through the WeldEd uh, program, is to develop basic training materials and make them available to instructors that can be used to supplement existing curricula. And you know, Rich is much more familiar with the WeldEd stuff than I am, but, uh, and I don't know how far along we are in, in, in that aspect, but uh, I think that's something that AWS could provide or could, could help you with. Um, and I'm gonna cover these uh, four areas of opportunity uh, for uh, instructing about standards. Um, as Pat already talked about, and I, I'm, I was happy to see when I saw his presentation, he uses the same analogy that I do, uh, that these procedures are really the recipes for making an acceptable well. They provide the ingredients, which are the base metals and the filler metals, and the instructions, which are the parameters and the technique, that if we follow those, if we do the, uh, if, we, if we cook it correctly, we're going to produce an acceptable weld having the desired properties. These students are eventually, no matter where they go to work, they are going to be presented with welding procedures that, they're, that is going to guide them in how they, uh, how they do the, uh, the welding. So if we can help expose them to these procedures uh, and the, the aspects of the procedures, that's going to help them out. Now I'm going to focus primarily on the AWS standards, um, and um, we within AWS there are more than a dozen of these standards that directly address the uh, the topic of procedure and welder qualification, um, and so I'm going to but I'm going to talk really more in, in general, but once we have a qualified procedure. That gives the user an acceptable range of parameters that, if followed, will result in the creation of an acceptable weld. Now, I'm going to make one uh, comment here. One of the biggest problems I see in our industry is the fact that there is so much emphasis placed on the qualification of the procedure that once it gets qualified, people kind of let down their guard and they don't pay attention to the procedure. 
That procedure doesn't do any good sitting in the engineer's office on the bookshelf. That procedure needs to be in the hands of the welder and the welder needs to understand the information that's on the procedure and how to execute that procedure. And our inspectors need to have that procedure as a point of reference to verify that it's being followed. So this qualification activity is a very expensive activity, but it comes, becomes even more expensive if we don't follow the procedure and we end up with welds that don't meet the acceptance criteria. So the qualification activity is normally uh, born by the engineer, but the, the welder is the one that's going to follow the procedure. We have various types of welding procedures in our industry. One of those types is what we call a pre-qualified procedure. AWS D1.1, D1.6, the stainless steel structural code, and D14.3, which is the uh, construction and ag equipment uh, fabrication code. Uh, all three of those employ this concept of pre-qualified procedures. These are documented procedures. They have to be written down. I've, I've walked into shops before and asked where their procedures are, and they hand me the code book. He said, well, we use all pre-qualified procedures. They're in here. No, the code book tells you what has to be included in that pre-qualified procedure, uh, but it still has to be a documented procedure. It applies, it applies the use of approved materials and processes that are applied to pre-qualified joint details. So we're controlling the materials that are being used. We're, let's say we're limiting the materials that can be used. We're limiting what processes can be uh, used. And then we are specifically detailing the, uh, the joints that they're applied to. It is a very economic way to generate WPSs for welding common or weldable base metals with common processes. There are those in the industry that think that pre-qualified procedures are blasphemy. The fact that you didn't run a test to verify a procedure, it, it just doesn't make sense to them. How many times do I have to prove that I can produce an acceptable weld with a 7018 electrode on A36 steel? I think we, we've got that figured out. So why do I have to retest it? So that's what we're trying to do here. So it, it's not carte blanche. You can't just do whatever you want. You still have to operate within the guidelines of the code and the procedure. It also still requires qualification of the welders. This is actually, you know, it, our codes tell us that when we do a welder qualification test, that test has to be done in accordance with the welding procedure. This is an easy way to generate a welding procedure for use as a welder qualification test. We just, we just write it out and it's something we can hand to the welder to use. We also have procedures that are qualified by testing. Um, and the Qualification standard that is uh, produced by AWS is AWS B2.1. Um, it is the specification of welding procedure and performance qualification. This document is AWS's version of ASME Section 9. The two documents in terms of their requirements are nearly identical. Unfortunately, this is one of the best kept secrets in the welding industry. There's so many people out there that don't even know this document exists. But it is by reference, it can be used in a number of different uh, AWS, uh, meaning a number of different AWS standards, including D1.1. Now, 
in my work on the technical activities of, of AWS, we basically control or uh, review all the AWS technical standards. Uh, we looked at this topic of qualification 10 or 15 years ago, and we saw that there were more than a dozen standards within our realm that dealt with qualification. And they were all the same, but different. So we made a concerted effort to go to all these different standards bodies or these different code bodies and say, look, why is what you've got written down in your document any different than what's here? And we tried to move the society toward adopting this as the qualification standard instead of having each individual standard being a little bit different than the next one. We tried to standardize it. We have a couple of standards that are on board. We've got D17.1, which is the aerospace welding code, and we've got D14.3, which is the agriculture and, ag and construction equipment code. They tell you that if you're gonna qualify a procedure, you qualify it in accordance with B2.1. It has, like I say, it's so similar to uh, Section 9. One of the things is it has material groupings. Section 9 calls them P numbers. This code calls them, or this specification calls them M numbers. But the lists are virtually identical. One of the, one of my pet peeves in, uh, in D1.1 is the fact that if you're using one of their approved materials, which allows you to use a pre-qualified procedure, no testing required, everything's wonderful. But as soon as you step over the line and you choose to use some material that's not an approved material, now you have to qualify that material by testing. And when you run that qualification test, one thing they tell you is you have to qualify it in every position that you're going to use in production. Last time I checked, gravity has no effect on mechanical properties of welds. But, and the arguments is, well, it's harder to weld in a different position. That doesn't have any effect on the properties we end up with. Yes, we're gonna test our welders in those positions to see if they have the necessary skill, but we don't need to qualify our procedures there. The other limitation we have if we're using an unapproved material is that that procedure is now only good for welding that single material. If I can move to B2.1, I can qualify that unlisted material and I would qualify all of the other materials in that same M number group. And I can qualify the procedure in the flat position and qualify it for all positions unless impacts are required. So this is one to keep in mind. Um, Another nice thing about this is if I'm working to both AWS requirements and ASME requirements, I can do one qualification test and write two different sets of uh, paperwork and I can have an AWS procedure and I can have an ASME procedure. The essential variables are, um, are mostly identical. An outgrowth of B2.1 are what are called standard welding procedure specifications. They are based on actual PQR data. What they've done, they've gone out to companies and they've solicited procedure qualification records for those from those companies. They've grouped them together and they have developed 
WPS is based on these, uh, the worst case scenarios of all of this collection of PQRs. And they have generated the standard welding procedures. We can purchase these from AWS and we can use it as if it were a qualified procedure. We don't have to do that. We don't have to repeat the testing. It's recognized by many of the AWS standards. They're also recognized by many of the ASME standards, Section 9, for example. And then uh, it's actually recognized by the National Boiler uh, Inspection Code as well for boiler repair. Um, one thing that was interesting is that um, um, these, when they first came out, they were pretty low budget uh, procedures. But once they became adopted by the various standards, especially ASME, the price kind of crept up a bit. Uh, but you're still saving tons of money compared to the, the cost of qualifying a procedure. So like the pre-qualified welding procedure specifications, there is no testing required. These are just some covers from some of the uh, uh, standard welding procedures. These are what, this is what they look like. So it, in the title, it gives us a very clear description of uh, what is covered by these procedures. One thing that you'll notice here, there is a set, I think there's 22 or 23 of these procedures that were specifically developed for naval applications. Now, they don't cover the you know, critical Navy applications. Those are still dictated by the Mill Standard 248 requirements, but for non-critical types of stuff, um, they have developed these standard welding procedures so that a contractor can use this procedure to actually do work for the Navy. So how do we incorporate these WPSs into the into curriculums? Uh, we need to develop lesson plans where the WPSs are used to describe the welding requirements for assignments. Maybe they aren't formal WPSs. Maybe they're just a technique sheet. But it's something that the student can look at and set his machine within the ranges and understand how he is supposed to make that weld. We use WPSs to describe how welder does act an actual qualification test plates. Other things I've seen, uh, you know, I think you're, you're probably, I'm sure, more probably more aware than I am, the importance of developing relationships with your local manufacturers in your area. I've seen this taken to the extent that some of these manufacturers will actually take parts that are non-critical parts and let the students actually weld on real production parts, especially if they're trying to develop a workforce where they want to draw from your program. So if you can develop those relationships and have the students actually working on real parts using those procedures, and those processes, they're going to be even better prepared to go to work for that company. In terms of performance or welder qualification, uh, the procedure, you know, what we're trying to do there is show that we've got a set of conditions that will produce an acceptable weld. So now our attention turns to the aspect of verifying that an individual has the necessary <coughs> skill 
to execute that procedure. Um, and part of that is the ability of the welder to weld according to a, a welding procedure specification. While this isn't always done, it's a, uh, it's a good practice uh, to actually, like as I say, have a set of instructions or WPS you can hand to the welder so he knows exactly how to weld uh, every test plate. Typical methods used to qualify welders are more consistent from one welding standard to the other compared to procedure qualification. Uh, so it's much easier to establish testing conditions where one test could qualify a welder for multiple standards. Again, I can do one test, I can develop, he can be qualified for AWS work, for ASME work, for possibly for API work. All these things can be uh, documented from a single test. The typical essential variables for performance qualification are the process, the position, whether or not there's backing present, uh, the product type, meaning plate or pipe, uh, and then the type of weld, meaning groove versus fillet weld. The presence or absence of backing is a key uh, essential <laughs> variable. All standards recognize that qualification without backing will qualify you for with backing. However, unless we're qualifying for one-sided open root pipe welding, qualifying without backing may be overkill. Most of the structural tests that we see in D1.1, there's a backing present. Welding position. I tend to like, if I'm gonna train a, a student, welding in flat position, I mean, it's a good way to start, but if, if I want that student to start really understanding how to apply that process, I really like the horizontal, the 2G position. The welder has to learn where each weld bead is placed. It, it's a very educational position. Plus, he is then automatically qualified to weld in the flat position. Now, grooves typically qualify welders to weld fillet welds. However, if if that welder or that student is going to be primarily doing fillet welding in production, I would rather see him run a fillet weld test. In my opinion, a groove test is easier to pass than a fillet test. And I can execute a fillet qualification test much easier than a groove test. So fillet brake tests and workmanship tests, I think, are better indicators of welder skill than groove welds if these are the type, main types of welds they're gonna be producing. So this is the uh, fillet brake test that uh, uh, we see in a number of our standards. Uh, four inch by eight inch, roughly half inch thick uh, plate. Um, the welder starts at one end and welds approximately halfway across the, uh, the joint. He has to stop, clean the weld if necessary, and then restart and continue to the other end. The weld has to be the proper size. It has to meet all of the visual acceptance criteria, including that start-stop area. So I can look at this specimen and do an initial evaluation. If it doesn't look good, I'm not gonna go any further. We throw it in the dumpster and we start, it, start the next one after some instruction. 
If we do, if it meets the visual requirements, we're going to cut an inch off of either end. One of those ends we're going to polish and, and etch just to make sure that the cross section is sufficient. Primarily, did the welder get fusion all the way down to this corner? Because that's the, the critical thing for the fillet weld. There has to be fusion. That corner has to be consumed. If it's not consumed, then that fillet weld is uh, insufficient. If the macro looks good, we then take the center portion and we somehow break it. We break it the easy way. We break it so that we're collapsing the face of the weld. And again, the primary thing we're looking at is whether or not that corner, this corner right here, has been completely fused all the way across that specimen. No evidence of incomplete fusion, especially in that start-stop region. That is a difficult test to, to pass. I think more difficult than a groove wall test. So it's very telling. Preparation materials is simple. It's easy to administer. Uh, it requires visual acceptance before we do any cutting or testing. Uh, as I said, it's not an easy one to pass. Um, and also, it's a more appropriate test if that's the primary type of weld that the welder is going to be working on. These are just some examples of uh, welder or some workmanship samples that uh, these actually came out of uh, D14.3. In fact, D14.3 actually lists workmanship samples as a valid means of qualifying a welder. And that workmanship sample can be developed specifically for the types of welding that are going to be done. So they can be customized, again, to meet requirements of the company where that student's going to be working. Uh, exit qualifications. Every student should have multiple qualifications upon graduating. Uh, they have to, they're still going to have to qualify once they go to work for some company, but if they have some pieces of paper in their hands saying that they have passed tests, that's going to help them get that first job. And then it's going to be up to them to, to continue on. Um, so the more experienced they are with this qualification activity, having done it at school, they're going to be able to go to the weld booth when the manufacturer asks for them to do the test. They're not going to be intimidated. They're going to be comfortable with it. They know what to expect. And they're going to know what it takes to pass that test. Um, just, I'm going to throw this. I, I call it multi-skill tests. Uh, uh, a lot of these uh, VICA and other uh, skills competitions require that uh, they basically give the student a, or the participant a drawing and they have to make some components. So they have to measure, they have to prepare, they have to fit the pieces, and then they have to weld it. So these types of tests, I think, are, are helpful. They're, they're good training tools. Uh, they, they give the student more than, I mean, just welding up a qualification test plate's nothing. But if they have to apply these other skills to produce an acceptable result, that's just going to make it make them better when they enter the workforce. Finally, our students need to understand acceptance criteria. Uh, the better they understand the quality requirements, the, the better welder they're going to be. They have to know what the, where the goal is. You know, where, where's the bar being set? Um, 
So the basic inspection skills need to be taught and there needs to be an understanding of the quality requirements. <clears throat> Table 6.1 of AWS D1.1 I think is a good starting point. It gives you a, uh, a very simple listing of limits on uh, um, you know, cracking, incomplete fusion, uh, undercut, porosity, and so on. Um, it's maybe not the best thing out there, but it's, it's a good reference point. Um, they need to know what types of welding discontinuities exist and if appropriate, how to measure them. Uh, for example, students should understand the proper way to measure fillet welds. This is probably one of the most misunderstood things in the industry. Uh, people just don't understand the basic principles. Um, so this is a skill the welder, I mean, if, if the drawing says that he's supposed to produce a 5 16 fillet, he needs to know how to use the gauge to verify that it's 5 16 The welder is the first inspector. If I have welders that are going to do their job and then hand it off to the inspector to check without even looking at it, I don't want him in my workforce. I want a welder to inspect his own work and be pleased with that result before he hands it to the quality personnel. It has to satisfy him or her first. So, um, codes and standards are going to play an important role in the career of our welding students. Uh, the greater understanding they have, the greater potential they're going to have for growth and advancement uh, toward further career goals. Now, some students are going to be content with, you know, working as a welder, and, but even there, advancing from one type of welding to more critical types of welding. We need every, we need all of those. Um, but this can be a, a really valid stepping stone or stepping point for, uh, for a higher, more advanced positions. So the more knowledge and awareness of welding standards, uh, it's going to be a means to achieve uh, these higher goals. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. So, any questions, comments? Good story.